Good afternoon and welcome to Signs of Destiny 2004. I'm your host, Dr. Chet Snow, and as we continue our Sunday afternoon program, it is really my very great pleasure to introduce to you a woman that I met uh, in England, in fact, after having heard of her and her very pioneering work into the scientific investigation of how crop circles get formed and possibly what kind of material uh, we're working with here uh, involving the crop circle phenomenon. Nancy Talbot is uh, from Baltimore, but she um, got interested in the crop circles in 1991 and worked with William Levengood in Michigan for several years, John Burke, and they formed the BLT, or Burke Levengood Talbot um, work, and then in 1999 she incorporated it as the BLT Research Incorporated. And she is the president and CEO of that organization who is still actively involved in the scientific research to understand crop circles. That's expanded now into soil analysis, and all, actually Nancy's personal journey, which I know she's also going to share with us today, has expanded even into greater realms than that. But I'll leave that for her to tell. So without further ado, Nancy Talbot. Thank you, Nancy, for being here. Hello. I know we're running a little late, so I'm going to get into this pretty quickly. It's really nice to see uh, many of you whom I've seen before, but I know there are new people uh, here again and those of you who have seen the overview, forgive me, I'm going to do a very brief overview of the early work and then immediately get into some of the newer work. But because there are people here who have not seen uh, some of this early work, I'm going to do a brief overview. Well, I think I am. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do. Wait, let me get it back to the zero because if All right, now I'll dance for you. <laughs> as, as Chet said, BLT uh, was a name that occurred because in the very early days, uh, William Levengood, the biophysicist in Michigan, uh, John Burke from New York and I had gotten together to try to do a more in-depth examination of plants and soils in crop circles at that point in time pretty much in England but also in a number of other places. Uh, the Brits in particular needed something to call us uh, because there were several of us and just as a joke I came up with this BLT because in America there's this BLT sandwich and I thought it was kind of cute and catchy. It never occurred to me that it would go as, as it has, it would develop as it has, because now we have some 13 scientists involved in a number of different disciplines. We have just recently added an RNA DNA specialist. We have a mycorrhizal fungi a specialist. We have a soil chemist, uh, several geologists. Uh, as the early work has become known, and a great deal of the early work was published in the scientific literature, other scientists well, completely unacquainted with us and with uh, the crop circles, read this work and become interested themselves. I'm very, it's amazing to me actually that these people are calling me now completely spontaneously. I'm not trying to get them. Although I do put out to the universe uh, that I want a microbiologist, for instance. I was aware that we needed microbiology work done and I have for about two years now been saying to the universe, if there is somebody out there like that, please bring them to me and lo and behold, they have. It has, it has occurred. So it's a joint effort here, I think, between uh, a number of scientists, a lot of field workers, and whatever is behind the crop circle phenomenon because it seems to help. Do you have a light bulb yet? Oh, we do. Now get it focused. Uh, I don't have a slide that gives you our website, but all of this early work is uh, in detail up on the website. It's www.bltresearch.com. Uh, I will get a slide one of these days made that actually says that. All right, very quickly now. Uh, we know, we're going to go over what we've already learned, what we know about crop circle plants and soils that is important. Uh, this is the best known parameter the elongated apical node. This is the top node on the plant. 
And here you see formation plants. In the bottom, you have the controls. Uh, this expansion has been documented more thoroughly than any of the other parameters. More work has been done. There's more data to support it. It is uh, a situation related to uh, heat, probably microwave radiation, hitting the moisture inside the plant stems, causing that moisture to turn to steam. And then, in the case of the apical node, or top node, seeping out and stretching that node as it does. The top node is elastic, and it can stretch. Further down the plant stem, as the steam builds up, other things occur. It's very important to notice also that this elongation has occurred here. There is no bending, or very little bending, uh, because the only photographs I had earlier were of elongated nodes that were also bent. Some people got the idea that they had this bending, had to be part of it. It doesn't. And here's a case that clearly demonstrates that. I'm going to replace what's on the website with this slide, because I think it's a, a better one. A very early case uh, from England in which the samples were taken you know, across that diameter. What you see here is node length. Oops, I got the wrong. Do it with this hand. Node length indicated here. The sample uh, numbers here. The red bars simply indicate the degree of node length. And you can see very clearly in this formation that all of the down crop had elongated nodes, significantly elongated nodes, over the down controls. This happens not only, we know, in geometric formations, but it happens in these randomly downed or chaotically downed formations, formations that have no particular geometric design. This is from BC. And here again, we have elongated nodes. And here are the controls taken from that particular randomly downed event. We furthermore know that in some cases, you get a change in the node length that is consistent with a law in physics known as the Beer-Lambert principle. The Beer-Lambert principle <coughs> describes mathematically the absorption of electromagnetic energy by matter. Whatever causes this change is electromagnetic if, in fact, the mathematics produce this sort of a graph. Here we have a circle with a flat center. Here are two standing centers. And the node length is greatest at the center here decreasing as a function of distance away from the center, and doing it in this very linear fashion. So we know that what that means is that what caused the node length increase was electromagnetic in character. This was not a plank or a board. This was something emitting electromagnetic energy. We also discovered <coughs> that in some formations, this change in the node length, this is apical node length again, occurs in standing crop, not in the down flattened crop, but in standing crop away from a given formation. In this case, we again got the Beer-Lambert result, <coughs> a linear change, with the greatest node length at the edge, decreasing as we sample down to the, to the road on this side and out into the field on this side. And so when you think about the idea that planks and boards have to be uh, what's going on here, how in the world do you explain that in crop that is, is standing? It's not flattened. No board has been anywhere near it. Here is a plot of the data from that particular formation showing you this Beer-Lambert result again in the node length change. The node length decreased according to this mathematical principle, which again means electromagnetic energy had to cause the change. We also know that the seeds in the plants are, are changed or altered. We have wheat seeds here at the top, the controls, and here the corn. And you see the difference in size. When crop circles occur in immature plants, uh, before that seed is fully formed, the seed does not form completely. And if it does, it's markedly dehydrated. It will weigh less. Uh, this does not happen quite so severely when the crop circles occur later on in the season. The seeds there often are dehydrated, but not so severely. We know that when those seeds are germinated, we get three basic changes, two that we see most often. The first change is a marked reduction or repression of seedling growth. That seedling growth sometimes is so severe that you don't get seedlings at all. You get almost no germination. In this case, again, we have uh, the formation. 
and the controls. You can see the difference. At this, I think this is seven days. Well, I'm on about seven days. But you see the difference in the growth rate. The seedlings here at the top are unlikely to survive in the field. So essentially, that particular series of plants was sterilized by the effect of the energies. If it can't reproduce, if the reproduction is not going to take, then you have a sterile plant. Another effect which has been seen but has not been followed up enough to be certain what's going on here is that in some hybrids, well in most hybrids, you get a very even growth rate. In non-hybrids, it's normal for crop to grow variously. It's not all the same height at the same time. In this particular formation, what Levin Good found was that the formation seedlings were growing all at exactly the same rate as if they were hybridized, and yet they're not. Here's the normal growth rate in the controls, and look at this perfectly even. So it appears that there was some sort of synchronization of growth that went on in this formation. The third effect is one that occurs primarily in older crop when the formations occur in late July or August, when the seed is fully formed. So the seed is not growing at this point, it's fully formed, and the plant has begun to die down. In those cases, in a large number of them, what has been found is that you get increased growth rate and increased uh, reproduction, I mean, uh, greater yield in the formation samples as opposed to the controls. Furthermore, it was discovered that some of these plants will then survive without water or light for long periods of time. This is an amazing result and one that Levin Good and Burke eventually developed into a patent which they have been trying to market to the seed companies replicating that particular effect. Now, the heating moisture, the energy, I mean, the heating the microwaves inside the plants, you know, are causing steam. When it's farther down the plant stem, what happens are expulsion cavities. Those particular, or that particular expulsion cavity was one of hundreds, if not thousands, observed in this particular formation in England. Uh, you do hear from time to time people saying that only simple formations are um, genuine, are not man-made. I don't think that's true. In fact, I'm certain it's not true. In this particular case, we had not only no elongation, but many, many, many expulsion cavities. Here we have another case where we have both no elongation and expulsion cavities. In this particular one, which is, I don't know how many years ago in England now, but what I discovered, I was doing this myself, this is on a hillside, and I found that the expulsion cavities tended to cluster around the lower edges of each of these features. There were more of them on the downside of the slope than there were on the upside of the same circle or ring. And if we're going to be honest and let the data speak to us, which I believe is what we should do, we have to then take very seriously this heart in Holland some years ago. Because in fact, in that heart, and we're speaking of the arrow as well as the heart itself, we found not only apical node elongation throughout the formation, but also expulsion cavities. Now I know you look at this and you would assume this is man-made. It was my response when I saw it. But if in fact the science means anything, and after thousands and thousands and thousands of plant samples, and you know all these different countries over 12 years, uh, I mean if the work means anything, then you have to take it seriously for an event like that too. The next uh, parameter that was discovered fairly early on is the presence of magnetic particles or magnetic material in some of the crop circle soils. This particular event was at Chur Hill in 1993, and as you can see, the magnetic material here is embedded in the plant. It is not on, it's not superficial, it's not just lying on top of it, it's embedded. It's very interesting that in this case, not only did we work on this, but Rodney Ashby from England, a totally independent researcher, uh, also got some of this material and carried on his own studies. The two studies both produced similar uh, information, although ultimately different conclusions. In that case, uh, the soil chunks showed this, these melted ridges. Again, we're looking at the presence of heat. 
and these lovely little hematite bubbles, which again are indicative of the fact that heat was present when this event occurred. Levin, Good, and Burke postulate that this is the result of meteoritic dust, uh, tiny little microscopic particles filtering down to the Earth's surface, getting caught up in the plasma vortex, which Levin Good believes may be causing these. The microwaves emitted by the plasma, producing the heat, which then melts the microscopic meteoritic particles, causing them to form these bubbles and also the tiny little spheres. EDS here on the bottom is the one that was done on that material by Levengood and Burke and shows you that that particular sample is very pure iron and oxygen. And here's one of the little bubbles in one of the little spheres. These things tend to be in the range of 10 to 50 microns. Once we found them in this case, we began to do soil sampling generally all around the world and discovered that these little particles were frequently found in crop circles, perhaps 70, 75 you know, percent of the crop circles that we looked at. Now, we didn't at that time do EDS regularly on these particles. Levengood pretty much assumed that they were the same particles. We are starting a new study, or actually we're halfway through it now, because some of the evidence we've gotten recently suggests to us that the magnetic material, I mean the microscopic uh, meteoritic material, is not always what's going on. <coughs> we think something called fly ash may in fact be what some of these particles are. Fly ash is a byproduct of coal-powered nuclear or nuclear-powered plants, not nuclear, coal-fired power plants, and it was distributed all over the place, particularly here in the U.S., before pollution controls went into effect. Uh, these particles are in exactly the same size range as the, um, the, micro, the meteoritic material, but their elemental constitution is different. Therefore, EDS can perhaps clarify, if we do it on all of these samples, how many times we're looking at actually meteoritic debris, or whether in fact we're looking at something else, and is it in fact fly ash. If that turns out to be the case, what is going to be of great interest is how, is, how are these particles distributed. The fact that they're not meteoritic material, if they are not, well, is interesting, but what's really interesting is how are they deposited? What sort of deposition do we see? A slide that Levin Good produced simply to illustrate that they are in fact magnetized, meaning they were formed in a magnetic field. He has a slide that he's pulled underneath the uh, microscope there to show you that they're, mag they're magnified. And here is the part that's really interesting. This is a chart showing the deposition of magnetic material, whether it's meteoritic or what, in a formation in Canada. At the center of the circle, the least amount increasing in a very linear fashion to the edge. Now, if it's meteoritic material, it was coming down from the upper atmosphere, heated up, the spheres formed, and as it impacted the Earth's surface, it was then deposited. If it's fly ash or something like that, then it would have been in the soil to begin with, and it must have been then sucked up and redistributed. But the distribution will be terribly interesting. Uh, another piece of work that we have finished a couple of years ago and which we now can include as real knowledge, I think, uh, Dr. Reynolds and I have finished this paper and will finish the, the illustrations and all that go with it uh, right after Thanksgiving, I hope. And we're going to submit it for publication hopefully in 2005 and then it will join the scientific literature that is already available, which pretty much documents facts in crop circles. This is an event in Canada. Uh, the interest here was to do a new study completely. Although Levengood's work is uh, absolutely fundamental and a foundation for the study of crop circles, I started to realize when he and he and John Burke and he and I had published these papers that we have published and the scientific community was not getting it, that in fact it was going to take more than one person's work, more than one approach. And so I started looking aggressively for scientists uh, at accredited academic you know, universities, people with different areas of expertise, geologists, microbiologists, uh, I'm looking for an atmospheric you know, physicist, whatever, because it doesn't look as if one man's 
uh, credentials are going to be enough. Also, it, he's limited, of course, into how much he knows. His field is biophysics. There are many other things to look at. Uh, a geologist friend of mine in Utah uh, had told me about, pardon me, I want to go back, that's Levin Good, had told me about a result she had gotten in Logan, Utah. Uh, she was a specialist in clay mineralogy. She'd gone to the Logan, Utah formation, taken some samples, and done x-ray diffraction on these samples. She was looking for a change in the crystalline structure of the clay minerals in the crop circle soils. Now, she couldn't afford to do an exhaustive test, but she did do some. And the results that she got indicated to her, a clay mineralogist, that there was a change in the crystalline structure. Now, there's no way on the face of the earth that planks and boards could begin to explain changes in crystalline structure in the clay minerals. She told me about her results. I went out trying to raise money to then replicate that and to do a real study. Lawrence Rockefeller called me up out of the blue, uh, offered me the money to do this study. We then did it. And <coughs> the results are very strong. In this study, we first started with Levin Good and his work on the plants. What we found were no elongations and expulsion cavities. These are five different formation plants, and you're looking at the first node, the second node, and the third. And here are five controls. So in this particular case, we did have no elongation, and we did have expulsion cavities. Furthermore, we had expulsion cavities all the way down the plant stem. This is the first case in which we had seen expulsion cavities in anything more than the second node. They were in the third node and also in some cases in the fourth node. In addition, we found the presence of magnetic material. Levengood found the presence of magnetic material. Uh, not in superabundance, but it again was present in this formation. After Levengood's work was completed, I took the soils and was looking for an x-ray diffraction specialist, a mineralogist, a uh, material science specialist, they call them. And I found uh, Dr. Sam Iyengar. Iyengar had never heard of crop circles. He didn't know what they were. This was a part of the design of this study was to pick professional people with the PhDs associated either with major universities or in an accredited laboratory and who did not know each other and who did not know what crop circles were. Sam Iyengar was the guy we came up with. He's here at the XRD machine now. Uh, what his job was, was to simply extract the clay minerals from those soils, which is quite a tedious process, and then, once they are extracted, mount them on slides and run them through the XRD machine. What the X-ray diffraction does is it bounces off the various minerals inside the sample and produces a pattern as it emerges out of the machine, which produces this graph. Now, I'm not quite clear, frankly, how they know which one of these peaks is the illite smectites that we wanted to look at. I don't quite know how they know that, but they do. This is the illite smectite peak that we were interested in. And what we were looking for was how narrow does that peak get? The wider the peak, the less crystallized the specimen is. The narrower the peak, the more crystallized. The better ordered the atoms. We're talking about on the atomic level here. And as those atoms become more ordered, more organized, lined up in rows in a three-dimensional manner, what you get is a tighter and tighter, tighter peak. It's a very mechanical process. The machine does it. It has nothing to do, I mean, other than the fact that the machine is calibrated, so Sam himself, doesn't do anything past once the mounts are created. And then you get all of these graphs. So he did this work, it took quite a while, and when he was finished, uh, he gave me the data. It's called the, it's called the Kubler Index KIs, and it is simply a measurement of the width of that peak at half height. Halfway between the top and the bottom, measure the width of it, and that gives you something called the KI. So he produces for me this list of KIs for the samples and for the controls, and he sends me all of the graphs for each one. I then took that information to a statistician whom I found, 
uh, with a, a background at MIT, with a PhD that we needed in this case, never heard of crop circles, didn't know Sam Iyengar, had never heard of Levengood, etc. And again, the idea was to completely avoid bias. This man did not know what a crop circle was. All he knew was that he was getting a list of KIs, and he was being asked to see, was there a statistical difference between the KIs in the formation and the KIs in the controls? The first question he was asked was simply that, you know, was there a difference? He replied that yes, there was at the 95% level of confidence. Subsequently, uh, we actually checked that result twice because we weren't quite sure he could be right. But when we realized he was, I then took Levengood's node length data. I submitted it to him also and said, okay, is there agreement between Levengood's node length change and where we found these crystalline changes in the soils? Is there any correlation? Not only was there, it was at the 99.2% level of confidence. I mean, this means that almost at every location where we found a change in the, in the crystalline structure in the soils, we also found these node length changes in the plants. That indicates that whatever caused those changes, it, the same energy. I mean, it, that's what it indicates. It doesn't prove it, but it strongly suggests that the same energy was responsible for both. Now, the problem with that is that the kind of energy it would take to change the crystalline structure in the soil is in the range, it's either massive pressure of the sort mountains pressing down on sedimentary rock over literally thousands of years. Clearly, in a crop circle, you haven't got any mountain on top. Or it's heat, and heat in the range of, say, six to 800 degrees Celsius for a period of hours. Now, if you have heat for a period of uh, hours in the 600 to 800 degrees range Celsius, what would happen to the field? get blown, get burned up, <laughs> and the field wasn't burned up. So it was a big problem. I was lucky at that point to, this is the, uh, uh, the regression analysis showing you the correlation between node length change and the crystalline structure in the soil. It's a very subtle change, but it is statistically significant <laughs> and apparently then real. Because of this information, and because we knew that any change of this sort in the soils would not be accepted easily by the academic community. It has literally never been seen in surface soil before. It is found in sedimentary rock, as I said, caused by the pressure of mountains pressing down for thousands of years. That's what normally causes it. We were lucky enough to get the assistance of perhaps the world's most eminent uh, clay mineralogist. This is Dr. Reynolds from Dartmouth. He was head of the Earth Sciences Department there and is now emeritus and literally is the guy who writes the textbooks on clay minerals, particularly illite smectites and this XRD technique. So I took all the information to him and asked him to check our work. I didn't want to put this out until I was certain that we hadn't made a mistake. He immediately said, well, of course you've made a mistake. This never happens in surface soil. You've done something wrong. And so he looked, he took all the statistics and looked at them first, assuming we'd simply made a statistical error. And several weeks went by and I got a call, well, no, the statistics looked all right. So then he assumed that, that Sam Iyengar had done his work incorrectly, that somehow the mounting of these clay minerals had not been done properly or that his XRD machine wasn't functioning properly. So he asked if he could have all of the mounts or some of the mounts. I sent him all of them. I said, yeah, please, <laughs> if you're willing to do this, go to it. So then several months went by, and I did talk to his wife a couple of times in between. Um, and then finally I heard from uh, Reynolds himself, and it was a very different kind of conversation this time. He had gotten exactly the same results that Sam Iyengar had gotten. The machines were working exactly the same, the mounts were done properly, and in his estimation, the work was competent. What his wife told me, he never has said this yet, but his wife told me that in a conversation she overheard him having with his son, he said something to the effect of, I wonder if these people know what they have. Well, of course we don't really, but he apparently does. 
he asked us to do a few things to check. Uh, he wanted us to uh, do a test that looked at the glycolation condition, and you don't even need to know what it, what it is. It had nothing to do with this. But the other thing he asked that we do was that we take some of these controls and submit them to microwave radiation. He wanted to see, could microwave radiation cause this? Now, as you can see from this, it didn't. We got no consistent result here at all. Uh, microwaving these samples up to 60 minutes did not cause this change. It's something else. Uh, after reviewing all of the data that we had, and me talking to him a lot about crop circles so that he got to know something about them, his conclusion was that there was no energy known to science at the moment that can cause what we have just documented. And that's essentially what we have said in this paper that I hope, I don't think it'll be much trouble getting it published because he is so well known. And it simply states that these are the results, this is what we got. We have no explanation in known science for how this result could have occurred. Now the new work. This is one of the uh, scientists who's contacted me recently from the University of California at Davis. He's what they call a mycologist uh, and a soil chemist. Mycologists uh, work with fungi. And here's a photograph to show you just common fungi that everybody's familiar with. What he works with, though, in particular, are what they call mycorrhizal fungi. These are fungi which exist in tandem uh, in a symbiotic relationship with the various plants that they interact with. The plant cannot survive without the presence of the fungi, and nor can the fungi. It's a symbiotic dependent relationship. Uh, they're tiny, tiny, tiny little organisms. Sometimes they're visible, as in this case, where you can see them around the, the root hairs here, and sometimes they're invisible. But this graph shows you some of these tiny little spores as the root systems merge and feed into each other. The fungi provide uh, access to nutrients that the plant needs to live, and the plant, in exchange, <coughs> uh, gives off carbon, which then helps the fungi to survive. Another thing that the fungi, the mycorrhizal fungi, do is cause a clustering, a clumping of soil around these tiny little root hairs. This again makes the nutrients more available to the plant itself. Now, the guy at University of California thinks that if, in fact, heat is present, if some unusual energy is present, these very, very sensitive organisms are going to show some sort of a response in their reproductive capacity, uh, in their life cycle, and perhaps some sort of aberrant growth. I am not sure, I mean, he's not sure what he's going to find. We're in the middle of this study right now. But the idea is that with the other evidence that we've been building up, we're expecting that we may find some very clear and demonstrable difference in the mycorrhizal fungi in crop circle soils. A diagram, again, just showing you the interaction, the fungi, and the root system of a normal plant. These tiny little spores, they can, they can be microscopic, literally. And there are many different kinds of, of mycorrhizal fungi that specialize with certain plants. Uh, of one of the mycorrhizal fungi you'd have known about, I'm sure, are these lovely things, truffles very valuable, and they are, in fact, mycorrhizal fungi. The first case, we have four cases that are being examined uh, this way from this last summer. The first one is this case from Arkansas, Peach Orchard. And here we have Joanne Scarpolini, who did the work in that case, uh, sampling her little heart out. She did a fabulous job down there. The farmer himself examining the crop lay. And we found a number of these. Do you see this here? That's a bird's nest, a little wren's nest. There were three or four in this particular formation that were built right into the standing crop and were knocked down without in any way being disturbed themselves. They were not squashed or flattened. They were simply in the down crop. We saw, we've seen this before a couple of times, but in this particular formation, I think there were three of them. This particular case was uh, interesting. It is interesting in a number of ways. This is the closest house to that particular field. The guy who lives in this house has dogs outside 
and two cats that live inside. He was apparently away during that weekend and uh, the animals were alone. When he got home the Monday after the formation had occurred, what he found was that his cats had literally torn through the screens to get out of the house. Furthermore, the dogs, which were in a chain link chain fence uh, enclosure, had somehow or other ripped through the chain linked fence and gotten out. There were something like seven or eight dogs out running around because something had disturbed them. Well, now we know because we've been doing this for a long time, that there's animal disturbance when crop circles occur, often. Not in every case, but often. This seems to be an indication, since the building is only about a quarter of a mile from the field, that the presence of the energies at that field, if in fact this is the real McCoy, may have disturbed these animals. The only other piece of information we have so far is that we're also doing, in addition to the mycorrhizal fungi examination, we're doing magnetic particle concentrations on all these formations too. And Nick Ryder has finished uh, the magnetic particle work on this particular formation, finding a very strong deposition peak at the edges around the very periphery <coughs> of that design. And this is the most typical deposition that we've seen over the years. So there is some indication here uh, from some of the ancillary uh, facts that this formation may be the real McCoy. The magnetic particles that were found in that formation were, this is just to remind me to tell you about that, we're, that's not from that formation, but we did find them there and Nick did find these peaks at the perimeter. The second formation we chose was uh, in Spanish Fork, Utah, and an enormous numbers of anecdotal stories about this particular one again. One in particular that's extremely weird. And I actually don't like to repeat some of these things when I think they're just silly. In this particular case, I have no evidence to tell me it's anything but silly. And so I'll stay away from it for right now. But there were, there were lights uh, photographed. I've seen, we do have you know, shots of that. There are lights photographed here. And then some other very strange stories. Uh, the formation, though, uh, is a little rough, a little less than elegant, perhaps, in its overall design. And I know that many people, particularly in Europe, uh, are of the opinion that if they're not neat and precise and elegant, that they are not, in fact, genuine. The physical evidence, the scientifically documented evidence, does not come to that conclusion. They don't have to be these pristine, elegant events, elegant-looking events, to be the real McCoy. In fact, many of them that have turned out to show these extreme differences in the plants or the soils or the elite smectites or whatever, are in fact much rougher. So you can't, I can't look at that and make any sort of determination and frankly feel that if we're going to do science, the point is to let the science speak. I'm not here to uh, make these, I can't make these evaluations with any authority. I have intuitions, but that's all they are. They're my intuition or my opinion. I'd much rather wait and let the scientists tell us whatever it is they found. And so we went ahead and really did some serious work on this formation. Uh, Melissa Crumpton, who is here somewhere, I don't know where she is, maybe she isn't here now. She was here earlier, did the work on this. And we have some photographs showing you, in this case, she's taking surface soil samples throughout the formation. And then the core samples. And these, for the fungi study, we have to get the roots, of course. And we have a core here, which she is jamming down into the earth to get this core sample. We took uh, a lot of these samples in all of these formations to make sure there was enough material for the scientists. Uh, of course, again, not only taken inside, but taken outside for the controls. The third case that we are uh, looking at in this study is this case in Minnesota. It was cut before we knew about it, but that really doesn't affect uh, looking at the root systems or looking at the uh, magnetic particle concentrations. As long as it hasn't been trampled to death, uh, we can still do those tests. Uh, Dean and Margaret Hard de Harport did this work for us out in Minnesota, and we took one of these circles and then sampled it very carefully along three radii or three diameters, again with both the uh, roots being taken and surface soil so that we can look at magnetic particle concentrations. The fourth case is from England. Uh, this is at North Down. 
And uh, a physicist who's working with us now, he and uh, several of his colleagues, along with some of my people in England, did the sampling on this one. Uh, this one was in barley. It again is, this one is a relatively simple one, but uh, we found visible node elongation in this one, uh, visible presence of expulsion cavities, and it therefore seemed like a good balance for the other three where we don't have visible node elongation. If there's node elongation in those other three, it's going to be subtle and not strong enough to see visually. Uh, there were no expulsion cavities seen in the other three. There were in this, and so it seemed very important to include one like this in the overall study. This is just a close-up of the lay in that North Down formation. Uh, this at the top is Nick Ryder at the SEMEDS. He's the guy who's going to be doing, is doing the magnetic particle concentrations, and he's devised a a very precise protocol, which uh, in the next lectures I'll be doing, I'll be describing, uh, so that you can understand how he's extracting these particles. Work he did on this formation at, at, Noble, Can at Noble, Arkansas, Arkansas, a year ago or so, is one of the things that made us start to look for a difference in these particles, these magnetic particles, because what Nick found in that case were, these are the particles themselves, but what he found is that we've got high titanium peaks in the magnetic particles in that formation. Now, we have seen high titanium peaks in the magnetic particles in some other formations also. There is no explanation for titanium being present if, in fact, it's meteoritic iron. That should not be present. However, it could be present if, in fact, this is fly ash. So, this is what we're doing. Lots and lots of EDS on lots and lots of samples so that we can narrow down which of these events are dealing, having meteoritic iron involved and which are not, and what is this other stuff if it is something else. Wanted uh, then to talk to you a little bit about corn formations. Uh, we, over the years with BLT, we've looked at quite a few corn formations, mostly in the US, and this is just one of them. But something very unusual is going on in corn, as Jeffrey knows, and as anybody who's really watching this knows. In recent years, I mean, this is what most of the corn formations that we've worked on have looked like. You know, basic circles with a spiral lay, which is very typical. Uh, some five, six, seven, maybe eight years ago now, uh, this event occurred, which was very unusual. It's never been repeated that I know of. It's corn. As you can see, it's not a circle. It's more of an ellipse. And the crop is laid from the edge into the center. I've never seen this again. This is the only time we knew about this. There's a close-up to show you the lay, again, from the edge into the center. However, uh, some 2000, maybe 2001, uh, Ted Robertson called me, and there was a series of circles down in Indiana. I think there were five of them. And he was reporting both them and the fact that he found uh, expulsion cavities in corn. These are all in, in corn taken from that formation. This is the first time I know of, of expulsion cavities being found in corn. Imagine the amount of energy it would take. You've got a lot more moisture inside the corn stalk. Therefore, it's going to take a great deal of energy to heat that up to the point where it turns to steam and actually blows holes through a heavy corn husk, which is exactly what it's been doing. So, you know, we had this to add to the plate. There all of a sudden there are crop circles in corn that are having these expulsion cavities. Then a series of events occurred in Canada, last summer I think it was now, in which we found not only one expulsion cavity, we would find them all the way down the plant stalk. Now this is a 10 foot tall cattle corn. I think I may have a picture, yeah, showing you the field worker there. And in those stalks, we were finding these expulsion cavities literally all the way down, eight, nine, 10 cavities in one stalk. Uh, I don't know what this means, but it sounds like there's some increase in the amount of energy being uh, expended. That's just a close-up of one of the corn expulsion cavities. In some of these formations, we also found complex lay. We are in the middle of a growth study on some of this stuff, and it's not quite done yet, but this is taken from one of the, one of the cases we're looking at, where we did have complex lay in corn. You know, this is not wheat or barley. We also have been finding massive twisting and spiraling 
of some of the stems inside the down corn. This again seems to be some sort of increase or new energy that is doing more damage than what we've seen in the past. And then we come to this lovely situation. This actually is a well-known situation in certain hybrids called brittle snap. When, if it's a certain kind of hybrid, a certain type, and it has a certain wetness in the growing condition at a very distinct period of time, this sometimes occurs if heavy winds then subsequently hit these fields. And it's been called brittle snap. You get a simple break at the node. However, there's some differences between brittle snap as it has been recorded in the past and what is going on in the crop circles. Uh, brittle snap, as they talk about it generally, number one, only occurs in these hybrids, these very specific hybrids. It only occurs if the growing season at a very specific time had been very wet. And thirdly, it only happens in the top nodes. And furthermore, it happens throughout the field. In other words, the entire field will be affected. What we're finding in this case and in many others now that we're investigating, we have it in corn, which is not the right hybrid. The growing season was not wet. The breaks are all at the base of the plant and it's contained within the formation. It is not throughout the field. In this particular situation, uh, the two field workers there, Laurel and Joe, literally took three weeks and went through every stalk in the field. They smacked every single stalk. Not one of them produced this result, only inside. So you got like 40 acres of these two women just banging them to see if we've got brittle snap anywhere else in the field, and we don't. So this is something new. Is there something in these energies which is changing the nature of brittle snap? Or is there something in these energies which is mimicking this condition that we already know about? Then we had this wonderful event uh, this summer. This was after the one at Miamisburg. Now Miamisburg's was in corn again, very intricate. Now I think the most intricate one that I've ever seen in corn. Last year, of course, in California, we had that huge long thing in corn, that bug. Well, now we get this thing in Quebec, and right after I got back from Europe, I went up there. This one, the crop is laid from the center out to the edge. We've never seen this before. A close up of it. These are going from here right out to the edge. Yeah? Did you all hear that? No tram lines in Canada generally because they fertilize with airplanes. Now, in, it wouldn't matter in a cornfield because you can walk between the corn rows. I mean, I did walk to do the samples and everything in this, but it's a good point. Uh, what I found more interesting, and I'll tell you in just a second with the next slides, but I mean, this, this looks like something hit the center and boom, the plants went out right to the edge. And I think I have a couple of shots in here to show you the way they went into the edge. We also found these expulsion cavities in the top, I think, not the first node, the second, third, and fourth nodes, and occasionally the fifth nodes. And in about 25 to 30 percent uh, of these plants, Mark Archambault and I did this, and we spent a lot of hours going through every single stalk in the field in the downed area. And of course, we didn't see these in the peripheral, plant, peripheral plants or in the controls. There's the farmer, and you, they, you, it just cuts it off there, but there are three expulsion cavities here that he's uh, demonstrating. But then we have this event. This just occurred three or four weeks ago now in Minnesota, and in this case, we have the crop lying in one direction only. It's all lying from the north to the south. I've never seen this before. Now, what's really interesting to me is that this circle and the one in Quebec were both in genetically modified crop. The farmers had never planted genetically modified crop before. This was the first time in both cases. And I'm wondering, you know, does that have anything to do with these very strange lays, very strange things going on in corn? Uh, I don't know, but it's one of the things we'll be looking at. The only other time I've ever seen a straight lay of any sort was from this formation in England years and years ago which I don't know, I don't know very much about except that it has the straight lay. So that straight lay is quite unusual. Can we change the slide, the carousel now? That's my 
little guy to tell me we're at the end. I was reading something in Chaos Theory, a book called Chaos that I'm reading right now, and the guy is talking about how there are three symbols that for some reason are in the more mystical literature about chaos. One is the, cor is, uh, the crow, one is the uh, fox, and one is the coyote. And I think it's very interesting that the, my little slides like that are of, uh, so far crows and foxes. I'm going to go find one of a coyote now. All right, I did get to go to Europe uh, this summer for a number of reasons. Uh, and I wanted you to meet uh, Eva from Norway. She's uh, the lady right here who invited me to come and do a lecture. She runs the Norwegian Crop Circle Group. And while we were there, she and I went out into the fields and we did observe this area, several of these randomly downed area, with again this radial sort of lay. Uh, there aren't a great many crop circles in Norway, but there are some, and she and the people who work with her do the best job they can to document them and to sample them. We didn't sample this because it turned out that we got a telephone call uh, notifying us that there had just been a brand new crop circle found in Sweden. Now, I was rather upset this summer because I had to be in the office the whole summer because of the fungi study, and I hadn't been in any crop circles. And there I am in Norway, and damn wouldn't you know, I get the call, there's a crop circle in Sweden. So this guy, whose name is Terry, a filmmaker in Norway who's doing a video, a documentary that I think is going to be wonderful, uh, he had asked me to come too to be part of this uh, thing. And as soon as that's out, we'll make sure you all know, because I think it's going to be a good documentary. But at any rate, Terry gets the car, and we all piled in and drove to Sweden. And we saw this wonderful, wonderful formation. It's almost 400 feet long. It occurred in a field that is completely surrounded by trees, as you'll see in the photos. No roads anywhere nearby. It was discovered by a woman on horseback. And I don't know if anybody other than we and perhaps a few people in the village actually knew about it. This is the best shot we could show you. It starts here and goes all the way that way through the field. It takes up the whole field. And there's no way in except for this horse track down along this end. Give you a little bit more information as to what it looked like. It was quite a long drive and we didn't get there until the afternoon. It was raining and we got the, the photos of the best we could do. We did sample uh, this and did some very good measurements. This is Terry's brother who is an engineer. He did all of the measurements of this particular event. He was totally skeptical. And on the way up, all we did was hear about how these things were our imagination, you know. <laughs> so I said, OK, you go do, you do the measurements, because that's what you're good at. Well, he did them. And I started to hear this yelling coming from one end of the field. Here he is again. And what he's discovered is that the center in every single one of these circles was markedly off center whether it was a standing center or a down center. And from the engineer's standpoint, he's trying to figure out how in the hell was this done. And it suddenly hits him that he couldn't do it. He was of the opinion that he could not have done this. Therefore, he started to get much more interested. And he's just here demonstrating, <laughs> I don't know how this was done. And this is always a secret with professional people. You show them something they know about that they can't explain, and then they become more interested. This is, uh, I think you say her name, I think Sonia's close, probably not too close, but she's one of the uh, people in Norway who helped. And just so you guys don't think I ever do anything, <laughs> on my hands and knees there doing my little soil work. We only were able, we were only able with the light and everything to do one, but we did several diameters in that one circle, and we will look again for the magnetic particles then uh, I had to go to, to Belgium to do a lecture there. And this is Jan, who, is the, who runs the Belgium Crop Circle Group, and his partner, Bart, and Valentin. Valentin was marvelous, as was, we had a wonderful time. This is a reporter. And the field where we are is where some crop circles have occurred in Belgium. They simply wanted me to see them. And what's interesting, and I've seen this now in Poland, in Norway, in uh, England, and all over the place, the environment, the general environment, the lay of the land is very similar in these places. 
regardless of the country. This is one of the formations uh, they had last summer. And again, the expulsion cavities that they found in some of the plants inside that formation. They took me on a nice little trip. To, I've never seen this, this uh, megalithic site. It's, uh, in the, it's way up in uh, western Belgium, I think. And there were a number, I took a number of shots, and there are these funny little balls, but who knows what they mean. But they were present in every shot I took of this thing, and not present when I was just taking pictures of the uh, area around. We had a wonderful little trip there. And then briefly, let's talk a little bit about England. I know you've seen a lot of the slides, and I have just included a very few with ground features that I thought were of interest. This being perhaps the most interesting thing. Can you hear me? Uh, you know, this weaving, this interlaying is one of the features I really, so we're going to get undressed in public. I bet you all can hear me without the mic. Oh. Okay. I mean, it's this, uh, this layering effect, this weaving, that I think is very interesting and to be taken seriously. None of the lay, the crop lays, have been scientifically documented. We don't know for a fact which ones are most significant. But common sense tells you some things, and frankly, I think that when you see that, it may be worth paying attention to. In this particular formation, which when I first saw it, I thought, gee, I don't know, that looks kind of, doesn't look real to me. But we have these lovely little lays inside. I would never make a decision one way or the other without sampling them, but like everybody else, I notice certain details which have not been documented that in fact are of interest. And in this formation, this double, you know, I'm not quite sure how you would do that if you were mechanically flattening. This lovely thing at Windmill Hill. Windmill Hill is one, a special place for me. I've had some very unusual, very interesting things go on there. And when this formation occurred, I was drawn to it right away, not knowing it was at Windmill Hill. But do you see here, do you see the tight spiraling of those stalks around that center standing thing? And I've got even a better shot from this formation. See this? And then look at this. Oh, wait a minute. OK, there. See that? I mean, it's wound around. Now, I suppose somebody could have stood there and done that, but to me, these are very interesting details in the lay. Uh, in the B formation at Milk Hill, uh, what I was interested in, or am interested in, are these three circles. Now, I don't know uh, this formation. There's a new design element, this scalloped thing, which I had never seen before this year. It occurred in this one first, then at Tan Hill, then in a couple of others. And I thought, ooh, are we getting some new thing here? Well, it turns out that the people from France and a couple of other friends of mine who had been in this circle found expulsion cavities, but they only found them in these three circles. Nowhere, uh, nowhere else in the formation. Now, I have put calls down. I'm talking to people in Belgium, people in Italy, a lot of people who were in that formation to see if anybody else found you know, the uh, expulsion cavities anywhere except in those three circles. If, in fact, no one did, and the only place they existed were in these three circles, is it possible maybe the thing was mechanically created and you know who came along and zap, zap, zap? I don't know. It's not very often that you see evidence in one section of the thing and not elsewhere, uh, at least in the ones that I've looked at. But if anybody here knows anything about that formation and expulsion cavities being present elsewhere, I'd like very much to know. Here's one of them in close up. And then we have this formation. And there's a lay here. I think it's the next slide. Look how far off center that center is. Um, I think it's Burry Farm. I can't remember them all anymore. I have it. I can tell you at home if you email me. I can look it up. I just don't remember. Oh, it's England. Yes, it's England this summer. But which exact place, I'm not certain. 
Uh, then we have this, and we need to talk about this. These are splits. Now, I have seen these from time to time. Other people have seen them from time to time. Andreas has produced these in a formation that he mechanically flattened. Uh, and I trust him if he's telling me that he did. Uh, people have asked me if something like this, does it in fact turn into an expulsion cavity? Many people thought it did. So what we've done is in several cases in England this summer, we have sampled these plants with these splits. We've taken them home to, well, to our location there, dried them down and seen over the weeks, do they become expulsion cavities? So far they have not. We have then gone back to the same formations in which we found the splits and examined them in situ, in the place where they occurred. In other words, the plants haven't been cut. They have not turned into expulsion cavities there either. This splitting may be, uh, it's one of two things, I guess. It is either a, a situation where the energies involved were not intense enough to actually cause a full-blown expulsion cavity. In other words, it's a baby expulsion cavity or it is something related to mechanical flattening. And I don't know yet, but we're watching it very carefully to see what more we can learn. What I do know so far is that in none of the cases we've looked at has a split like that turned into what we would call an expulsion cavity. My real reason, however, for going to England or going to Europe this summer was uh, Robert in Holland. How many people here actually know anything about Robert? How many don't? Has never heard anything? Okay. Uh, Robert is now 24 years old. I first got to know him when I think he was 16. He's the only person in the world, so far as I know, who is somehow or other aware of when crop circles are going to occur in his area. He knows exactly when, he knows where, and he often knows what they're going to look like. And he knows this through some sort of I don't know what you would call it, vision, dream. I mean, you can call it whatever you like. He simply has an awareness. Uh, this started when he was a very young man and has progressed to amazing, an amazing situation. The reason I've decided to talk about this, for years I have not, even though I have been visiting him now for eight years, and I stay with the family and stay there for weeks at a time, so I know them all pretty well now, is that his father was terribly concerned that uh, his son would be thought of as peculiar, that he would be castigated, that he would be excluded from something normal in life. The father is a banker, a very responsible adult. His mother is a, a mature a woman, an excellent housewife, a good mother. He has two sisters. It's a very normal middle-class family. And their basic concern was what was going to happen to Robert. And so we did not talk publicly about many things that are going on there. And I am not going to talk here about many things that I know that will be in a book that Robert's father has written and will be available to the general public, I'm hoping, within about a year. But I can tell you about many things that have happened to me personally at his home or in his company. And the reason for doing that is because you are going to be hearing, I know from him, and you're going to be hearing very strange things. And I don't know what's going on, but I can tell you what I've seen, and that may help you in evaluating whatever it is you hear down the road from Robert Vanderbroek. This is Robert in the, oh, this is 99, and Robert and me in his uh, living room back in those early days when we first met. We were called in at this time uh, we were doing, we had recently discovered Phyllis Budinger, who can do infrared spectroscopy. Nick Ryder was doing a lot of EDS for us. And what had happened was that there had been an incident. This is the back of their house, and this is Robert's bedroom. As you can see, their floor to ceiling glass doors, they open out onto a balcony. Underneath is the living room, the same floor to ceiling glass doors. In this case, Robert, at about age 15, I guess, and his sister, Madeline, Madeline, who is a fabulous person, were in his bedroom listening to music. And it was maybe 10 o'clock at night, and suddenly a ball of light, maybe 12 feet in diameter, a glowing, rotating, extremely bright ball of light appeared uh, in front of those doors, scaring the dickens out of the kids. 
They went running down inside the house, down to the parents, uh, you know, mom, mom, or papa, papa, whatever they say, coming back up to see this ball of light. Well, by the time they got back up, the ball of light was gone, but what existed was a pile of white powder immediately outside the doors. There, was, there were burn marks on the uh, zinc roof of that birdhouse, which Robert made, actually, in school. There were burn marks up there on the eaves and on the outsides of the doors. Uh, they told a colleague of uh, someone they knew in Amsterdam about this incident and asked if there was any way to get an analysis done of the powder because the father wanted to know what this powder was. Uh, that eventually led to me because the guy in Amsterdam was one of our field workers and we got the material in the lab for an EDS. It turned out to be a very, very pure level of magnesium, we thought oxide to begin. We later did infrared spectroscopy. In fact, it was magnesium carbonate, a slightly different chemical manifestation of magnesium. Now, that's not an unusual substance. What's unusual is the purity level. There were no trace elements. There was nothing, if this had been a flare, for instance, magnesium is used in flares, and it had burned down, you would see traces of the container, and there were none. So the only thing that we could tell them was that it was a very unusual uh, purity level of magnesium in the magnesium carbonate form. This is the EDS that simply illustrates that. You can see there's nothing else. Uh, my first encounter there, I had gone to Amsterdam after this first examination to do a lecture in, uh, in Amsterdam, and the family came to see me. They wanted to thank us for doing the work and I guess just to meet me. And so after the lecture, I, had, I don't remember how this exactly happened, but I had a couple of days and they asked if I would come and visit them uh, at their home, stay with them. And so I, what not, why not, I'll go do that. And this is the living room, not exactly as it was set up back then, but we're in that room underneath Robert's bedroom now. These are the windows going out to the backyard to that small patio. Now these people, they're very elegant people, perfect hosts, and I had this very strange sense that first night I shouldn't go to bed. I'm a late night person anyhow, so I thought, well, maybe it's just that I'm used, you know, I like to stay up late. But I knew it wasn't quite that. I just knew I shouldn't go to bed. I said that they should. Now, Robert doesn't speak a lot of English. Neither do the parents, really. It's quite an effort to do this communication because I can't speak Dutch. Robert was very tired, so he did go to bed. But his father and mother and I stayed up. The parents were too polite to go to bed until I did. So they were trapped down here in the living room at two o'clock that morning. And we had most of the lights off in the living room and we were simply talking. And they were describing to me some of the events which had been going on around Robert. Uh, flashes of light which were seen out in this garden every so often, like flash bulbs going off. Not very often, but occasionally. Uh, the ball of light that came to him in the field the very first time that he ever saw this happen. And he watched balls of light off in the distance one of them detached itself, started to rotate around him. He passed out, and when he woke up, he was lying in the middle of a brand new crop circle. And they were simply telling me some of these details. All of a sudden, the father, whose name is Peter, said, there's one, there's one. And now he was facing, looking in that direction. I was sitting in this chair facing the other way. I didn't see anything. But he immediately started to tell me that he had seen a flash of the sort that they had seen before. So we then turned all the lights off inside the house. I turned the chair around. Both he and his wife came and sat on this table, all facing those windows. And suddenly, this energy started to happen. A tingling is the best way I can explain it, coming from about my wrists. I was sitting, and it was coming up my arms, up my front, up my back, and slowly, but a very distinct and clear tingling. And it was increasing in intensity as it got higher. When it got to around my neck, it was getting very intense. And my thought, frankly, was the hell with science, I'm getting out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was, I was scared. At exactly the second that I had that thought, the tingling stopped. It completely stopped. And outside these windows, right there, there started to be balls of light that were very sort of bluish and transparent 
and they were fairly far away, maybe eight, 10 feet away. There were flashes of light going off all the time, like cameras. There were blobs of light that were dense, opaque, and irregularly shaped. They were coming down as if they were being dropped off the balcony, boom, and then bouncing along the floor, right along the, right along the patio. And it was all going on at once. And it was completely contained within those two windows, those two frames, and about, you know, about, that, about an eight by 10 area out there, focused on those windows. But we have flashes, balls hanging, balls falling, and these blobs. And it's going zoom, 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 zoom like this. I didn't know where to look first. I had no idea what was going. never seen anything like that in my life. It went on for 15, 20 seconds. And then all of a sudden, it just stopped. Nobody said anything. The parents didn't make a sound during this entire situation. We waited, and all of a sudden, the tingling started again. And it did exactly what it had done the first time, moving up my body front and back. And at this point, I only know it's me. Feeling it. The mic just went again, I think. OK. And uh, again, it built up and built up and built up gets to this area of the neck, and I'm thinking, where's the door? And right as I'm thinking, OK, this is too much, again, it stopped, and the light started again. We watched this while at least five times as repeated. It might have been seven. We're not clear. But at least five times over an 11-minute period, this light show went on out there after the tingling. Finally, it was done. And I don't know how I knew this, but none of us had said a word. The only thing that had happened was that I had gotten up and gone right next to the doors. I, was, I didn't have the guts to go outside, but I'd gotten as close to those doors as I could get, and I could see them coming down from above. I was just trying to see as much as I could. And suddenly, when it was over, I knew it was over. And I turned around to them with the first words that had been spoken and said, well, that's, it's over now. The father was visibly shaken. He was not a happy camper had not seen anything like that before. It was right in his backyard, I and mean, it was very dramatic. His wife was also shaken, but I don't think quite so. We, after a while, we talked a little bit about it, and it turns out that they were feeling the same thing I was. They were feeling the uh, electrical discharge or whatever. There wasn't any smell, there wasn't any noise, no hair standing up on my arms, just that tingling. They apparently experienced it just exactly as I did. And it was the first time that, that anything like that had happened. And they were convinced that it had happened for me, was how they put it. Now, I didn't personally have the sense it was for me. I did have a very strong sense that it was what I would call location specific. It was absolutely directly outside those two windows. And of course, I was directly inside them. But that doesn't mean it was for me. It could have simply been there, or it could have been for one of them. Here's a shot again showing you that area in the daytime. But these things were coming down right, right along this thing. I mean, bouncing along just like a ball would bounce. Now, the, these trees, which are no longer there, the whole thing had started real near these trees. It was from them that flashes of light seemed to emanate in the past. These are cedar trees, and I do love them. And I'm sorry they took them out. But in that first visit, among other things, I decided I would document you know, with the uh, camera some of this stuff. And so I went all the way around the house taking pictures. So this is one roll of film. And this is the first experience I had of photographic anomalies at Robert's house. And you're going to see a lot of those. So I thought I'd show you this first one. I was standing right next to that tree where the flashes have emanated. And I was shooting you know, the balcony. This is shot number 18 on the roll. Shot number 19 produces this, at which point the camera completely spontaneously rewound. I mean, it just rewound itself. This is that particular image. I didn't even notice this when I got home. I thought it was just a glitch. I didn't pay any attention to it. And it wasn't until some time later when I started to see these pinkish, strange lights regularly that I realized that this was probably the first incident. I don't know what it means. It's just what's happening. Uh, over the next several years, I mean, enormous numbers of events occurred, and you're going to hear many of you, I mean, in the book, you will read many of them, some of them utterly unbelievable. Uh, this is another one I actually witnessed. 
uh, a ball of light rotating in place in front of that window and the subsequent burning of the paint. Uh, I mean, it happened. Crop circles occurring out in back of the, of the house regularly, consistently. Uh, balls of light impacting skylights in the house and leaving traces, you know, like that. In one of these cases, are you telling me something? We're not, okay. And after that first series of events, this tree was in the backyard at that point. The backyard is now quite different. But at that time, there was that little tree. And when I came back the next year, I brought with me a crystal. Oh, this wasn't science. This is just Nancy talking. And I had this idea that if there was a consciousness, if there was some purpose in all of this, that I would recognize it, that I would witness it, whatever you call it. So an Indian had called me that I didn't know, and he claimed to have gotten this crystal in a very unusual way, and that he was directed to give it to me. So I thought, okay. So I took the crystal to Holland. I hung it in a little plastic bag in that tree the day after I arrived, just as a, I think people who do a lot of metaphysical stuff would call it an offering. I did it sort of in recognition of the fact that the energies existed whatever, whatever kind of energies they were. I hung around for a while, 15, 20 minutes, and watched. Uh, but then I went upstairs to take a bath. Immediately after I went upstairs, Robert and his mother, who were downstairs, yelled for me to come back down because this little crystal, which was in that little bag, a little thin plastic bag, had suddenly attracted a ball of light which came screaming down in broad daylight, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, from the sky and etched out the edges the perimeter of that crystal. The crystal didn't fall out of the bag, it was, but the little piece fluttered down to the earth. Now, what kind of energy can very carefully burn this outline and not affect the back of this piece of, and the plastic is so thin, you can tear it with a fingernail. They watched while it happened, I didn't see this. I was upstairs, by the time I got down, the little piece of plastic was fluttering down to the ground. Uh, I don't know what that means, but again, you know, thinking some sort of interaction is going on here. Uh, over these years, many, many photographs. Uh, Robert discovered that if he went into crop circles at night, he could get anomalous photos, and he gets them all the time. In fact, when we're there, most of the rolls of film that I shoot, there'll be a few normal shots, and all the rest will be abnormal, or have these strange light things. This is just one of many, many, many. Uh, showing you these different, this particular one I like a lot. Robert took this photograph one year. I like the little things. They look kind of like seahorses, and I like them. So I asked him for a copy of the print. He gave it to me, and I had it over my desk for the whole next winter. The very first photograph I took the next summer with a Polaroid is that one. It's, a, it's the same creatures or same design, but in reverse, and on a Polaroid that time. Then we have this year, which is, I don't know, I forget the years anymore, 2001 maybe, uh, where these crop circles occurred. Some people here have heard about the pink-purple light ball, I'm sure. Robert, this is, the photograph here is taken from his bedroom, the balcony again, uh, in June, I believe, uh, observed one night a pinkish-purple football-shaped ball of light come in from this end of the field and come in to this area. It became stationary, it elongated into what he called a pinkish purple disc shaped light, not a disc, a disc shaped light, which then discharged an energy down to the crop surface. And when I ask him to tell me about it, he says, like the shuttle, like the shuttle, meaning that enormous amount of energy you see when the shuttle takes off. He watched this and watched the circle open up underneath. Uh, he called me right away to tell me about it, and I immediately called Elcho Hasselhoff to ask him if he would sample this formation for BLT. I didn't think I could afford to get over that year and didn't want to miss this incredible uh, event. Uh, before Elcho could get there to do that, Robert witnessed a ball of light in the afternoon, about a week later, that came in and hovered over this area in broad daylight with a heat effect around the edges, and he watched as that crop circle opened. That summer there was a third one, which I then did go. But those are the first two. By the time I got there, there had been another event that same summer where he had watched another crop circle form. And I felt I had to go, and I did raise the money and did go and do some sampling. 
Uh, that's their garage with some of the plants drying down. This is the sampling diagram of those first two. Elche was supposed to have sent those materials to us, but he got intrigued and ended up doing the examination himself, which I was very annoyed with at the time. But now, in retrospect, think, well, that's not such a bad thing, because it turns out he got enormous results. And it's independent, you see, of, of Levengood. This is always good when you have completely independent concurrence. This is the most extreme example of what he discovered. The node length change here, greatest at the center, decreasing as a function of distance out to the edge. A very linear decrease in node length size, which again means caused by electromagnetic energies. All right, then we have uh, a number of incidents. Notice the table, the little iron table here on Robert's balcony. And see what's happened here. Robert came into my bedroom one morning, early for him, because he doesn't get up early either, yelling. He had waked up early, decided to get something to eat, gone down to the kitchen. The table was up there when he started. When he got downstairs to the kitchen, which is right over here, the table was lying on the ground with all these pieces. And it frightened him. He came running to get me to, to I don't know what. Uh, we, I got dressed, we went out and looked at it. Yes, it was smashed. Yes, it had been on the balcony. I don't know how it got there. And as we walked back in the living room, after looking at this, the stereo came on full blast and scared the absolute, you know what, out of us. I mean, out of nowhere, suddenly this oh, wham, very loud. Now, we, we were no, nowhere near the stereo. He was nowhere near it. This is kind of poltergeist behavior. So that was the next thing. Then one night, Robert and I were in separate rooms up here. I was listening to music. He was doing something in the sunroom. And the CD in my record player started to go zoot, 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 zoot. I don't have a CD. I'm not very technical. I thought kind of like at the end of a record where the uh, needle, you know, is rubbing. So I called Robert. He came in. No, it wasn't that, of course. And as he came in, this light starts to go in cadence with the CD. So we went out into the hall, did everything we could. To, he's just trying to zap it to see if he can make it happen. Didn't have any result at all. And for the rest of that evening, it independently would do this when the CD would do it, with us nowhere near either one of them. We asked the father. Uh, I thought maybe we had a circuit problem. The father, being extremely precise about everything, informed me that every single circuit in the house was separate. There was no, this was not on the same circuit, so it couldn't be that problem. Then we had a whole series of incidents like this, which you will see in great detail, I'm sure, in the book. This occurred. Uh, the year we, Robert and I saw the crop circle form, the night before I got there. He doesn't take medicines, but in this case, somebody in his family, his mother probably, had gotten some homeopathic remedy for something minor. I mean, colds, flus, I don't know what. This has happened to them many times. It was sitting on this table, and suddenly, only Robert's medicine in, it, it burnt by itself. Nothing else in the package was destroyed at all. Only Robert's medicine. And this and many other events like this that have happened, he's learned he just simply doesn't even consider uh, taking medicines. Now to some of the stranger photographs. This lovely little cross design and this year, the same year I guess, Robert and I went into the field. It had already been cut. I got a number of strange photo effects. Here are two side by side. That's the one that, that we have the ball of light in this one, but look. I mean, there's Robert. I had this printed very dark to get more of a contrast here. I mean, we're out in the middle of the boonies. There's nothing there. I took the shot. I'm standing five or six feet away from him, and this occurs. Uh, then we have the whole incident where Robert and I saw the crop circle form that same summer. Uh, to read the details of that, it's on the website, you know, bltresearch.com. Go to eyewitness reports. And this whole event is there with all the photographs. This is the last photograph I took that summer after the eyewitness event. Robert and his family had put in a medicine wheel. And I was taking a few photographs out in the garden. The one right next to the medicine wheel gave me this effect. And you can see, if you look, it, it's in, right here in the, in the print, you can see the plants right through this light. It's not my thumb. 
All right, this is the event that occurred last summer, uh, and then around which we've taken all these photographs that I do want you to see. Robert was on his bicycle, he doesn't drive, uh, out in the fields in the evening, early evening, as he often and regularly is, in this case, some distance away from his home, but really not that far. He was on this road in this exact spot, actually. I think 10 o'clock, 10.30 at night. He observed a ball of light down at that end of the road, the size of a car, bright white, coming right at him. There was nowhere to go. There's absolutely no place to hide. It's flat. There are not even any ditches here. Uh, it became, it came to him, engulfed him, and as it did, he started to lose consciousness. As he was losing consciousness, he felt the bicycle upon which he was sitting fall to the ground. The next thing he knows, and it turns out to be several hours later, he is hearing rushing sounds. He is seeing lights coming at him like crazy. And he's lying right there. This is maybe three feet, four feet from the edge of, a, of an interstate in a place he has no idea where he is. The noise is the cars rushing at him. The lights are the car lights coming at him. It takes him a few minutes to get his consciousness together, and he realizes, you know, he's got to get away from here. And so he rolls down that little embankment. This is the view he had from where he was lying, so you can see how close it was to the road. But he rolls down the embankment, and there is a field, and in the field there is a crop circle. He can see it glowing in the moonlight. Uh, this is a close-up of one of the little circles that was part of it. He has no idea where he is, but he goes across this little bridge and out into the field. He's never seen this particular crop circle before. He knows it's one that's not near his home. He sees something glowing white in the crop circle, and he goes up to it, and he finds out that it's his white sweater that he had on when the light approached him earlier. Next to it is a black lump of something, and that's his leather coat, which was also he was also wearing at the time the light approached him on the road. So he picked him up and put him on because it was cold, looked around for his camera, which had been around his neck. It had disappeared. It's never been found. And after a while, starts to think, well, now I've got to get home. The bike is nowhere to be seen, so he starts to walk down this road. Eventually, he finds the bike on the side of the road and gets on it. It took him quite a while to eventually get home. He was 16, 15 kilometers away from his house in an area he never goes by himself. Uh, so he didn't get home till about 4, 4.30, I think, in the morning. Now, I arrived, I think it was either one, I think it's two days after that event, and he had recovered somewhat by this time. I did what I always do. I go out on the balcony and always take these pictures right away. This is the first picture. Before I'd even heard this story, I didn't know anything about it. I simply went onto the balcony and did what I do. This is one of the anomalies that I got right away. Then Robert and I went back to the field. He immediately wanted to take me and show me where this had happened. The farmer had cut it that day because it was the end of the season, but we went into the field, and this time we took his parents with us, which we usually don't, and his sister and his sister's boyfriend. So we were all in this field, and nobody saw anything of what you're going to see now. That's Robert just standing there in the field. This is his mom and his sister's boyfriend, Barry. Again, this, whatever this is. And then this shot, which was one of the last ones I took of Robert inside the actual circle itself. None of us saw any of this. And this happens all the time when I'm with Robert in crop circles. All the time it happens. I have rolls and rolls and rolls of film where I'll have maybe a third of the roll, in some cases half will be normal and all the rest are like this. This is last summer, I mean, it's most of the one we just, well, September, really, and I wanted to go back to this site and see if we'd get anything unusual this year. Here we are, that's one of the few normal shots I got. That's the spot where Robert had found himself. Now look at that, and that's a film shot, that's not a digital. I don't know what that is, but there it is. Again, when I'm shooting right there, here we are shooting down towards the area, and you see how the whole, the tree, I mean, I don't know what that is, but I had a whole series of these that are affected like this again. Robert actually in the field where it had happened, and that's the end of that roll. Now, I've just, the photographs are the rest. It won't take long, but they need to see the photos. Yeah, 10 minutes, but we, we have five minutes left. 
That's fine. That's fine. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll go very quick. Because the rest of these shots are shots that Robert and I took at his house. I'm going to show you the creature and then these things that are appearing at his house now. Okay. That's the chair, a normal photograph of the chair. And that chair becomes important. We have many, many shots like this. I mean, that's just, that's one of the least imposing, but one of them. And that's the creature that appeared over a 40 minute, it materialized out of smoke, like you saw in the other picture, over a 40 minute period and sat opposite Robert for some period of time. Now, I mean, I don't expect anybody to believe this, <laughs> but one of the reasons I was there was to see what I see this too. Robert said that this, whatever this is, when it bend o bent over toward him, he could see the wrinkles in its stomach. He says that he got impressions that it informed him that it is making crop circles. It is a spiritual being. This is not an ET in the sense that we think. As far as Robert knows, it is a spiritual entity and he and his family are completely convinced of that. Now here is the chair again and some shots I took of Robert. You see the beginning thing here? And lights. Notice Robert's hands. This is one photograph as well as his head. And do you see here? There are a whole series of these very similar to uh, shots that you have already seen or may have seen. I did not. His, the only person who saw these beings this time with the naked eyes, Robert didn't in this case either, was his sister. His sister did on one occasion while I was there. We saw them only through the camera and I stood next to Robert with a variety of cameras which were not his, they were mine. Cameras he had never seen, both film and digital and watched as he took the digitals because I could watch the LED screen and I could see them standing right next to him in hundreds of shots. Not one or two, hundreds over several weeks. This is his sister's room. She has seen them uh, and she and her boyfriend both saw them, scared the boyfriend half to death in daylight in that room and then again while I was there at night she said up in the chandelier. This being also and many others the, this is one of dozens of strange beings. Robert and I got a bird-like uh, creature that appeared when I was there and the only photograph I have left because some of them were erased that is of part of that creature is this one. The other thing to notice, you see the distortion here in the background? Now look at these. These are all ones that I took or Robert took. That's in the kitchen. The camera would occasionally be normal. We got a certain number of normal shots every, you know, every time, but the majority, 75% of them, were not normal. That was a relatively normal one, the same area. The Buddha that someone gave him sitting in his dining room. I was sick, I had the flu, he came up into my room and kept me company. Here he is just taking pictures of me while I've got the flu. And then I'm downstairs in the living room with the flu, that's the most normal shot, but look at, you know, what's that? And then look at these. You're going to see me repeated two or three times or him repeated two or three times. See the same image again up here? Again. There's a whole series of these streaks. Then we got a whole series of these one night. They all, well, this only happened one night and there may be a hundred of these. All taken just boom, boom, boom. We, we took literally hundreds every night. And they get very extreme. These being some of the more extreme situations.
And then this one, no, it's, I'm almost there. It's going to be the next one. All right. I mean, that was this one, though. I know, I mean, there is nothing, nothing of this configuration in that room. I mean, it simply isn't. There's, there's a, a wall there. But, I mean, these are just a few of absolutely hundreds. So, I mean, what I'm really trying to tell you is I have stood with Robert. We, I mean, I was right with him. He did nothing to cause any of these. I took the rest of them. I didn't do anything. I used film. I used Polaroid. I used digital. Something is going on there. And if Robert, if you see him in the future, and if he's telling you that something is going on at his house, you don't necessarily have to believe his interpretation. I would say leave that up to yourselves. But he's not lying to you. If he tells you something is going on there, it is going on. And all I want you to know is that, in my opinion, it's worth paying attention to, and I see absolutely no sign of any kind of fakery, even though it is pretty unbelievable. Thank you very much.